welcome everyone uh, to this session. Uh, it's great to see so many people joining it on a topic that is, is incredibly important. And the question we're asking today is, can a greater focus on human rights make life better for people with dementia? And I guess, if so, how? So, so my name is Toby Williamson. Um, I'm an independent health and social care consultant. I'll be facilitating the session today. Um, and I do work uh, in the fields of dementia, older people's mental health, mental capacity, research, evaluation, training, education, policy work, a range of activities. And uh, for a number of years, I worked for a UK charity called the Mental Health Foundation, where I led its work on um, mental health in later life, including dementia. And whilst I was there, I had, we had strong connections with, with the DEEP uh, network. Um, and it, we involved uh, people with lived experience of dementia in a number of projects that I led on. And one in particular in 2015 that uh, Philly and others uh, here were involved with was looking at uh, human rights issues and how they affect people affected by dementia. And just to say a note here that uh, uh, the late Peter Ashley, who was a person who lived with dementia, was very involved in that. So it's nice in this celebration of 10 years of DEEP and happy anniversary to DEEP again, that we also remember people who've been involved in the past who are no longer with us or no longer able to, to, to participate for their contribution uh, as well. Um, so um, yeah, I did that work back in, in 2015 then subsequently became an independent consultant, but I've continued my interest in human rights issues and dementia. And in 2019, I co-authored a book with uh, uh, Julian Hughes, a consultant psychiatrist called The Dementia Manifesto, which had a, a strong human rights based approach um, in the way it looked at dementia care. So it remains an issue that I think is incredibly important, um, is an issue that's really grown in importance and, and how people have been talking about it, um, including people affected by dementia, but services and policymakers quite considerably over the last four or five years. And DEEP can take um, a big credit for that, I think, for the way they, they've raised its profile and, and helped with those discussions and so on. So um, I'm going to now ask panel members to introduce themselves, and then we'll go into uh, a series of questions that panel members uh, will be answering. As Philly says, if you have any questions as we, as we go along, please post them in the chat room, and we may be able to come to them perhaps halfway through uh, the session or um, at the end of the session, but I really hope there will be time for, for some questions and answers. So I'll now... Uh, ask panel members to introduce themselves. I'll go around as I see them on my screen. And um, in their introductions, I'm going to ask them to say who they are and what their connection is with um, human rights and dementia issues. And perhaps say one thing in answer to the question about why is it important to talk about the human rights of people with dementia. So Nigel, um, you're first on my screen. So can I ask you to, to introduce yourself? Hi there. Thank you, Toby. My name is uh, Nigel Huller. I live in uh, the People's Republic of Town Hill in Swansea. Um, I was diagnosed in 2012. Uh, I'm chair of the Three Nations Dementia Working Group. I'm also a member of the UK Prime Minister's Challenge um, for, on dementia. And I'm a member of the European Working Group tour as well. Um, and quite briefly, I mean, human rights in the field of dementia is not new. You know, Peter Ashley paved the way, really, of people like him. Um, it's not new and it's not extra. It's something which we all should enjoy, irrespective of our, of our illness or frailty. Unfortunately, sometimes it becomes masks with, masked by the condition in which we carry, where people with dementia are routinely denied human rights because they're not considered able to understand or practice them. And I, and, I, and I get that because, it, it, you know, the, the Human Rights Act is a very complicated business, but it's just one of the tools of which, 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 which we should be using and would run concurrently with things like uh, the, the Equalities Act and the LPS. I, I tend not to talk about schedules anymore or articles. I tend to talk about dignity, kindness, understanding, fairness, equality and diversity. Um, and... To me, it's, it, I'm lucky we live in Wales, which promotes human rights. 
I'm a member of the Welsh Human Rights Stakeholders Team, and I also advise the Welsh Government on all matters of diversity and human rights. And I always say, use, look at what you're doing, look at what you're presenting, and say to yourself, is this good enough for my mother? or father, or uncle, or brother, or sister. And if it isn't, then it's not human rights compliant. I think we have a problem with the way that older people and people with dementia certainly are viewed. It's a deficit model. In the early days, there's a concentration on what's not what's not there, not what still is there, it could be built up. And from there, I think an ageist rhetoric arises. Human rights gives clarity. Human rights gives integrity to any process regarding services to people. And it's it must be premised on the inherent indignity of all, no matter where we are, frailty or uh, or um, or uh, illness. And I got a call, Mandela said, to deny people the human rights is to challenge their very humanity. And I think in some cases, particularly in dementia, we, we, we do get that. Mm. Great. Thank you, Nigel. That was a, a very powerful introduction. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Howard. Howard Gordon. Howard, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Um, I'm Howard Gordon from Sheffield. Uh, I was diagnosed in 2017. Um, I've used the convention in, locally to get services started. And I've also worked with the UNCRPD committee and the WHO Global Dementia Observatory. Um, one of the problems with the CRPD is politicians view it as a soft law, but it's not, it's hard law. In the report in 2012 by the Joint Committee on Human Rights called Implementation of the Rights of Disabled People to Independent Living, they stated that we are concerned that characterising the obligations assumed by the government under the Disability Convention as soft law is indicative of an approach to the treaty which regards the rights it protects as being less normative force than those contained in other human rights instruments. The UNCRPD is hard law, not soft law. The government should fulfil their obligations under the convention on that basis and must counter the public perception that it is soft law. Like all international human rights treaties, the Disability Convention imposes three distinct types of legal obligation on states. Obligation to respect, protect and fulfil the rights contained in the Convention. And under obligation to fulfil, it means that states must take appropriate actions, including legislative, executive, executive administrative, budgetary and judicial actions to, towards the full realisation of the rights in the Convention. And we, we, we face uh, an assumption of incapability when we're diagnosed. I mean, I worked in healthcare for nearly 20 years and I often heard consultants say it wasn't appropriate to refer someone with dementia to OTs, physios, whatever. But we have a right to those things and we're denied those rights because a, a, a professional will assume that we can't deal with that service, that we can't communicate. And it's up to those people to learn how to communicate with us. Thanks, Howard. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a question we're, we're going to come on to about how professionals can become, uh, practitioners become more aware of, of human rights. I'm just conscious that um, of the, when we start talking about the law and human rights, there's a, it's easy to start using terms that some people are familiar with, but not everyone's familiar with. So the CRPD, just for everyone's benefit, is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that the UK has signed up. So, so that was what Howard was referring to. And I think Nigel mentioned LPS, which uh, the new uh, that stands for Liberty Protection Safeguards, which are the new yet to be implemented uh, safeguards of people living in uh, well, en living anywhere, actually, who may be deprived of their liberty. So um, if we can just remember to try and uh, yeah, to remember that not all people, all members of the audience will, will know what all the acronyms stand for. Um, thank you, Howard. Uh, and I'll go, go to Lucy. Hello, Lucy. Nice to see you. Hi, everyone. Happy birthday. <laughs> Lovely to be with you all. Um, so I'm an academic at Bristol University and my research looks at human rights in relation particularly to social care and mental capacity law and I'm particularly interested in how that relates to the lives of people with long-term cognitive impairments like dementia um, and I think they're really important. I think they are hugely important for 
shifting cultures, cultural attitudes, and as an expression of ethics and values. So put as simply as I can, just recognizing that people with dementia and other people with long-term cognitive disabilities are persons first and foremost and treating them accordingly. I think um, I do a lot of work at the moment teaching social work students human rights and I think um, I think human rights are a good tool for getting people to think themselves into the shoes of the person and recognize their equal worth and dignity but we've got a hugely long way to go on that front in terms of education and culture reform and I'm also interested in human rights as a remedy so that means when something goes wrong can you use the law to solve the problems and there are lots of problems there um, I'm happy to talk about that further later but again we've got a long way to go and I'm interested in working with people living with dementia on how we can fix some of those issues. Great thank you Lucy um, and you, you're still doing your blog the small places blog. Oh, only when my children and students allow Toby I'll, I'll try okay. and do it more. I would recommend Lucy's blog uh, called City of Small Places isn't it, right, about, it. Um, yeah. about issues to do with rights. Yeah. Um, uh, Tom, Tom Shakespeare, can you introduce yourself please? Certainly, um, so my name is Tom Shakespeare, um, I'm at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which is a university in London, um, and I come at this from a disability um, rights point of view, I've written a lot about disability, and for me, um, dementia is another variety of the range of many, many impairments that people have, and therefore for me, if disability uh, theory is to get it right, it has to be open to people with dementia. Um, and that means several things. Um, it means, um, as everybody has said, talking about human rights. It means listening to people with dementia, first and foremost, because their experiences, they should, nothing about us without us is a principle from the disability rights movement. Um, the importance of language, um, but also, what I've tried to do in my disability work is to look at illness and impairment, because everybody with disability has an illness or impairment. I have spinal cord injury and achondroplasia and ADHD. Other people have different impairments. And therefore, I don't want to ignore that. I want to have that there too. I'm not going to say that that's not important. So that's the contribution I've made to disability theory, I think, and I think it's relevant to people with dementia also. Um, so back in the day, in about 2001, I uh, worked with Julian Hughes, and he's uh, a psychiatrist who, who was really pioneering in understanding disability, um, and he talked about the situated embodied view of the person, which I think is what Lucy was talking about. D people with dementia are people, and it's, it, you know, people are people not it's not about what you can do, it's about who you are and why you're important. And Julian has been very important in that. Um, and then I was very lucky in 2017 to work with Peter Mittler, who many of you know. And with Peter Mittler and my friend Hannah Zalig, we did a paper um, which was called Rights in Mind, Thinking Differently About Dementia and Disability. And people like Neil and Toby and others around this call don't need to read that because it's what you think anyway. Um, but others do. And so we try to contribute to that. And I was very, very happy to be a, an advisor to the dementia inquiry, dementia inquiries, and to work with and get to know uh, people like Howard uh, and many people in this call through that wonderful program as part of Dementia Voices. And I was really lucky with Hannah Zalig to be called to help evaluate the Dementia Voice Program. And that's what we're doing at the moment. And we're going to report back next year. And we've talked to so many people with dementia and so many people who support or work with people with dementia, all of whom say how important this work is. Of course, it's important, but it's, 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 it's valid, it's important, and long may it continue. Happy birthday. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Tom. And it's just really important and exciting in a way that the sort of we're building these relationships across the disability movement that is it isn't just about a specific disease or impairment that actually these alliances are forming and we're learning from each other so it's I was so excited when when you became involved Tom because obviously I knew your work in dis the disability field so to have you involved is, well it's is like what Howard said you know let's not have a deficit model 
And in disability rights, since the 80s, 70s, people have been saying that. Let's not rely on the deficit model. Let's look at the way that um, problems or barriers are created. And I think that's very relevant to people with, with dementia. Pe the barriers are created in society. Yeah, yeah. Yes, definitely. So, so thanks, Tom. And last but by no means least, Neil, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Then what a group to follow. Um, uh, first of all, happy birthday, Deep. I have watched with great excitement Deep Evolve over the last decade, and it's it's really lovely to be able to be invited to be part of this today. Um, in terms of me, my background is also in the field of disability rights and human rights more generally, um, both professionally and in activism. So, for example, I was the advisor on the, uh, the Joint Committee on Human Rights Report on Independent Living that was mentioned earlier, and that was my work. Um, and uh, but then in 2014, my dad was diagnosed with uh, with with Alzheimer's. And what immediately occurred to me, even though I know Deep was was underway and things there and some of the discussions have we heard were underway, but it still felt to me like dementia had been absolutely peripheral to the thinking around disability rights and the work that I've been doing. But by absolute chance, the same year, Peter Mittler got in touch with me and introduced me to Kate Schwaffer. And then I heard about the work Deep was doing and Philly was doing. And I got involved in some work around the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities as innovations in dementia and Deep were trying to influence that, that process. And those connections were made, I guess, in the same way they were made for kind of Tom and, uh, and for other people. And that was a, a really been a really powerful, uh, really powerful thing. Two reasons why I think human rights are really important. One, very practically, because I think people with living with dementia are far more likely to find themselves in situations of risk concerning human rights, whether that's from discrimination or the right to take decisions being taken away from people or people's liberty being deprived or facing institutionalization and so on. So I think dementia, the lives of people with dementia should be the focus of the wider human rights community and human rights defenders generally, not only advocates of people living with dementia. And I think that's still not the case and that's still work we've been to need to do. But I want to really echo what everybody else has said, that I think there's this cultural dimension, this political dimension, which is about human rights being a reaffirmation of the humanness of people living with dementia. Um, and, and I think that's no more important than right now. Uh, I wrote a blog last week uh, after the announcement about the latest uh, medical drugs uh, breakthrough of, of how that overall debate potentially just screened out the idea that the, the, the lives of people with dementia right now were important and these social barriers were important. Um, that's not to diminish the, the value of that medical breakthrough, but the overall narrative seems one that doesn't actually point to uh, improving the lives of people living with dementia. And I was reading an article last week in the New Yorker. It was actually about an idea in France that I imagine will be deemed controversial. It was an alternative to nursing care. It was a village in which people with dementia lived. But there's a quote in it that really caught my attention, which was that this place had this insistence that a person with Alzheimer's is not just diminishing in the sum of her symptoms, but a flourishing and evolving as a human being until the end. And I sort of feel that's what the Deep Network represents, a bit like People First movements or the independent living movement or the psychiatric survivors movement, or for that matter, things like Pride or Black Lives Matter or Me Too. It's about reclaiming and reasserting equal dignity and worth. And it's about making hope possible rather than despair convincing. And I think to those ends, as Tom has just outlined, I think uh, disability rights focus, as well as reaffirming the rights of people living with dementia to be in our world, as, as much a part of human diversity as everyone, it has that added ingredient of widening our lens to think about these external, socially constructed barriers that just don't permit people living with dementia to live the lives they could do were they removed, whether that's social attitudes, the way we design our built environment, communications, transport, our health and social support systems. So it allows us to analyze and see where those barriers are and, and actually to begin creating a world which is inclusive and can improve people's health and well-being in different ways. Thank you. Great, thank you, Neil. And um, I, I don't want to add, I don't think there's much I can add to, to everything that's been said so far. I suppose one, one thing that springs to mind is, now, for all of all the audience and all of us who live in England, obviously we're, we live under a government who aren't that, uh, let's say, keen on the notion of human rights. Um, and changing the dialogue around dementia um, to understand it as being both a disease and a disability is has been an uphill struggle in some respects. But the, the, the numbers of people on this in this session reflects, I think, the growing interest 
and, and relevance of, of human rights uh, in both policy and practice. But it's worth reminding ourselves that, as, as, as Nigel has already said, that in Wales and in Scotland, and I think in Northern Ireland as well, they have explicit human rights based approaches at the heart of their policy making around dementia. Now, what that actually looks like in practice, I'm not sure. But the fact that they explicitly say we want to take a human rights based approach is significant. So it's not something that's just this this slightly odd thing that, that sort of possibly gets in the way of policy and practice uh, in the eyes of some people who have a negative view about human rights. But actually, some parts of the UK have, have very much embedded it at the heart of, of what they do. So I'll stop there and I'm going to now ask the panel to ask, uh, answer some uh, two or three questions we've got. Um, and the first one is um, really how can we make sure that more people with dementias and their families know about their rights? And I just suggest to panel members, you just wave your hand and I'll, I'll spot you um, when you and ask you to answer. So who would like to, to have a cracker answer that question? Nigel, you got your hand up first. Off you go. You're on mute at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, first off, let's demystify the Human Rights Act altogether. Let's talk, talk about what it really is. It's a charter of fair play. It's a charter of representation. It's a legal document, but it's also a philosophical document. Um, and people's eyes roll in the back of their head when you start quoting uh, articles from the Human right, right, Rights Act because they don't understand it. But they do understand terms like fairness, equality, and, human, and dementia, after all, is wholly a matter of human rights and social justice and nothing else. That, that's, that's, to my view, what, what it is. So when we are presenting human rights to our human rights issues uh, to, to people, either with the diagnosis or the carers, that we, we present it in a way which says, well, you know, you shouldn't be treated like this. There's laws and legislations protecting you. And here's where they are. Here's what they mean. Here's, here's what we say. We produced a booklet in Wales called uh, Knowledge is Power, along with Deep, the cabinet group, Deep, um, the Deep Group Cabinet, I should say. And then it, it, it sort of simplifies what the legislation means. And it, it weaves it in then with all the other legislation, like the Good Work Act, like the Health and Social Care Act, that goes in it. My view, and it is my view, um, is, is that all legislation for all people should be based on the Human Rights Act um, because it's in danger. You know, the other day, the government was saying the way to to stem the tide of illegal immigration was, was to come out of the uh, Convention on Human Rights. Well, that's just nonsense. You know, that's just nonsense. That's just because they're uncomfortable with the notion of having to treat people fairly, I think. That's basically what it is. And I, and I if presented that way, People pick up on it a lot quicker than just being given, you know. We, we did a deep document. Was it, was it, I can't remember what it's called, Philly. Was it Human Rights, Your Your Rights? The booklet? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, yes, you're involved with that, that Philly led on, and that, that yeah. deep uh, guide to human rights for people with dementia. If we could put that up in the chat room, a, a link to that possibly, then, then people can have a look at it. It's called yeah. Our Dementia, Our Rights. I'll right. have, have a look for that. Yep. Okay. OK, thanks, Nigel. Would anybody else of the panel members? Yeah, Lucy. Thank you. Um, oh, Nigel, I really love that. As a, the Human Rights Act as a charter of fair play. I'm, I'm going to be borrowing that in future uh, lectures and, and conversations with human rights sceptics. Um, so I think I do. Um, I teach social workers human rights law currently, and I think getting it embedded in education is important. But it, it really is just the start, because if they go into workplaces where there isn't a culture of valuing and talking about human rights, it will swiftly get forgotten and left behind. So I think it, there need to be ways to get people to not just talk about human rights as just an additional layer of legislation they've got to think through but as something that they value that they they see the value in in their own practice um i think as nigel pointed out knowledge is power is is absolutely central but i would worry about an approach which requires people living with dementia and their supporters to have a fully fledged knowledge of the human rights act right at the moment when their rights are being violated because i think ultimately human rights law is also about making sure that people have got the resources they need to redress that imbalance. So if you take, for example, the right to liberty, 
if somebody is deprived of their liberty, there's actually a legal duty on the people who are depriving them of their liberty to tell them about their rights and tell them what they can do about it, tell them that they have rights to advocacy and to go to court and what's happening. So I think there probably needs to be more of an emphasis on professionals signposting to information about human rights for people where it's important. Um, and I was just thinking that you could create um, you could create a really accessible guide actually to um, a human rights guide to living with dementia, which instead of breaking it down in the way that lawyers love to do, you know, Article 8 means this, Article 3 means this, starts with problems that people with living with dementia commonly encounter and then talking about that in human rights and terms and what people could do to solve that. So starting with the problem and then human rights as the solution rather than expecting people to learn about, you know, the different bits of the Human Rights Act and the ECHR. Mm. Um, I, th I think there's a lot we can do, um, but I think that that knowledge is power point is vital because if you don't know you've got rights, there's not a lot you can do about them. And access to justice is another massive problem. I think if you look at what happened to people living with dementia during the COVID pandemic, particularly in care homes, we, we're talking really about mass illegality on an unprecedented scale in human rights terms, in terms of unlawful detention, unlawful violations of rights to family life, um, really, really devastating stuff, not even to mention the violations of the right to life for people who weren't able to access treatments that could have benefited them. And the fact that there has been next to no litigation around that tells us how weak the Human Rights Act is if people can't actually get to lawyers, can't afford to go to court and don't know that they can do that. Um, so I think we need to, as a start, keep it on the statute books, but we need to be thinking, well, how can people actually make this useful? They're evidently not able to use it right at the point where they need to. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. And yeah, you mentioned in COVID, um, Steve, this might be a, a bit of a tricky link to find. There was a really excellent report produced by the University, University College London, I think uh, International Care Network, which looked at how the rights of people with dementia had been violated during COVID. It's an international study, so it covers a whole range of countries. So um, if you find the link, uh, perhaps you can put it up, but not to worry if you can't. Yeah, Neil, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I just want to put a slightly different take on it I guess and, and that this is this is odd because I've spent my kind of working activist life sort of promoting human rights but increasingly and, and still inspired by them inspired by the ideas they contain but increasingly skeptical about what they actually offer directly immediately to secure change and I think it's in a conversation like this it's interesting when we begin to talk about uh practically using human rights we immediately then talk about violations of or preventing or addressing kind of violations of um well rather than there being a kind of program in terms of how we create the world that we actually want to 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 bring about um and i think that's where i, I would i would think the focus needs to be and i think it's what the work that, that deep does but we were talking about kind of individuals and families i think one of the really deep things is about people's imagination and expectations and that, that is being repeatedly shaped the idea that dementia is is a, a kind of life ending event rather than life changing event that there isn't possibility beyond the diagnosis of dementia, that we're not imagining living with dementia in the same way perhaps we're imagining the lives of other disabled people. So I think there's a, a massive job to do about addressing stigma and attitudes and raising our sights and our expectations before people will ever begin to think about using rights or that they're necessarily relevant to them uh, in their own lives. So I think that that for me is the kind of, that they're both important, uh, not one or the other, but I think that's, equally part of the challenge if our interest is in building a kind of more inclusive world then we probably have to start there um equally at the same time that the points that, that lucy and, and and nigel have made are, are crucial to and yeah that's a good point neil and i suppose sometimes people think of human rights as very much sort of protecting people from things that shouldn't be done to them but when if you look at the crpd the united nations convention on the rights of persons with disabilities there's a number of articles in there which talk about access to services so it's about how do you promote people's the opportunity for people with disabilities to participate in society and to receive support and uh, gain education and employment opportunities so it's not just about protection it's about empowerment in 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 a, in a general sense um if it's okay i'm going to move on to the next question i hope that howard and tom will will, will come in um but i'm just conscious of time and we've talked a little bit there about uh, making sure that people with dementia can know about their rights but what about 
practitioners and professionals and services? Um, how can we make sure that more professionals know about human rights in relation to dementia? Tom? Yeah. I think it's very important to start with training. So we train social workers, we train doctors, nurses, all the other professions um, that pe uh, people with dementia come into contact with. And I think we need to say that people are not, you know, primarily it's not about sickness, it's about difference and diversity and disability and rights. You know, you ought to be able to speak to people and you ought to be able to hear from people and have dialogue with people, not merely see them as, as invalid or as Howard says, you know, suffering from a deficit. So if we train people both at the start and during their train during their practice, then we can help educate them. I think also what um, innovations in dementia and um, dementia voices have done, which is very much to say, look, there is this network. We're publishing papers. We're publishing research. We are, you know, here. We're real. We are proper. Um, helps when um, academics and Others are thinking about dementia. It changes the conversation. Yeah, yeah, and I totally agree. The, the education, education, education is, is crucial. Yeah, Howard, um, you want to come in here? Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, there's a lot of work in a lot of universities now where they're involving people with dementia in their courses, um, either helping to set up the units or actually speaking at, at lectures. Um, the problem is, as Lucy said, when they get into the workplace, you know, the attitudes of dementia in the workplace, I know from working in healthcare, are so ingrained that the, the people at the top cascade those ignorances or, or whatever you want to call it down to different levels. And it's very hard to change those perceptions of those that are at the top. Um, it's finding a way to change their perceptions and their attitudes that, that's going to be the biggest challenge. Yeah. But, you know, People going through university now will be the consultants and professors of the future. So hopefully when they get to those positions, they'll remember what they learned at university and in their training and put that into practice. But unfortunately, for people like Nigel and me, it will be too late. You know, we're talking 20 years or so into the future. Yeah, no, that's a good point, Howard. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring you in in a sec, Tom. Just wanted to say, I mean, Philly, you may recall this, but actually... Health and social care services are sometimes the slowest to pick up on human rights. And when you were involved with uh, the government's initiative around dementia friendly communities, I think you were on a panel or on a group that involved people like British Telecom and Lloyds Bank. And when human rights was put in the context of the Equality Act, they got it immediately because they want to be compliant with the Equality Act. And they say, <laughs> what do we have to do to make sure we're compliant? And actually, services that have been working with the Equality Act on a regular basis get human rights because human rights isn't just about the Human Rights Act. It's about all the legislation like mental capacity, um, the Equality Act, the Care Act, which sits underneath it, which if services aren't compliant with that, they're, they're, they're ignoring people's human rights. So making that link is important. Yeah, sorry, Tom, coming in. I just want, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking. Yeah. Um, I just want to say very briefly, I, I really enjoy hearing from Nigel Howard and all of my friends and colleagues with dementia, because one of the things that's really important about the Dementia Voices Network, about all the work that's happening around this week, is that we are working with, empowering, listening to people with dementia. And I don't think that was previously possible. And so the work through DEEP to empower not just the folk on this call, but hundreds of people and say, you have rights and we will help you claim your rights. And that can't be ignored as part of the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, Philly, uh, uh, if you could just keep an eye on the questions and see if there are any, any good questions coming up. Maybe when we've uh, looked at the third question, uh, um, then we'll pick those up. So thanks for that. Does anybody else on the panel want to come in about this issue about making sure that practitioners know about human rights in relation to dementia? Yeah, Nigel? Well, we all accept, I guess, that dementia services should be value-based. We, we all accept that. And to, to do that, we need better. We need better in, informants on on, uh, on uh, informant inform people on human rights and equality acts and all the legislation that goes to making everybody's life uh, a, one of value and quality. Better literacy 
in, in human rights can inform better care planning as time goes on, turn your decision making on its head really where everything becomes a right base, right space as to need space. And we're not actually looking at people as something of the needs being done to, but people who need to be engaged to do things together. Uh, and human, human, human rights approach, the, the human rights approach has revo revolutionized dementia care, uh, dementia care uh, in, in Wales uh, and the way it's, it's planned. Uh, nothing happens in Wales uh, unless it's co-produced. And one of the children that human rights and uh, Equality Act has is co-production because you've got people in the room talking, which they, they should be, which is the, the basis. Then human rights decision, decisions become rights based, not risk based. And it, it's almost like a light bulb moment. Um, and going back to my, one of my original things, I, I should be premise that everybody has a right to have a say in the way they treat it. And this is why the, we need the integrity of the Human Rights Act to ensure that happens and the Equality Act and any other tool that supports us. Thanks, Nigel. Yeah, Neil? Yeah, I agree with all those and particularly the, the, the importance on the, 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 the central voice of people living with dementia in these debates and, and, and of, of people disabled people, people who draw on social care, other things, I think can be utterly transformative in, in the outcome. And if you look at the new House of Lords report today, uh, which took that approach, the kind of focus of it is just radically different as a, as a consequence. But just, just on this question, I think, so to bang on about it, I think, again, it's affected by narratives of dementia and public expectations and the public story of dementia, I think, weighs very heavily on how uh, public services are organised, how professionals behave. So some of it's about an understanding of the law, but some of it is just deeply cultural. And I think one of the challenges, I felt this, I worked for the Equality and Human Rights Commission for several years, and then after that, trying to do work to shift public thinking around human rights. But if you imagine kind of where people's human rights might be violated uh, in a kind of relationship with a, with a frontline worker in a residential care home, it, it, we're not going to expect those frontline workers to really understand chapter of verse of the Human Rights Act. Somebody needs to do the job to translate that into the practice and the behaviours and the cultures that you would expect to see. And I still think that's a bit of a deficit. I still don't think that work is being done. I think there was a real energy when the Human Rights Act came into being around this stuff, but over time it's dissipated. But fundamentally, that's where it, it makes a difference, not necessarily at the level of strategy and policy. So it's how it then flows down through through this system into people's lived experience. And I think that's that's the work that's left to be done. Thanks, Neil. Um, I'm going to move us on to the, the last question in order that we have time for uh, Q&A. But I'm conscious that Lucy did mention about training social workers. So if you can segue an answer you have for this final question uh, to talk about, obviously, that work as well, do feel free. So the last question I'd like to ask the panel is, is quite a big one. Um, what would the world look like if the human rights of people with dementia were fully realised? So a nice, straightforward question there. Um, <laughs> anybody want to have a crack at that? Well, it, it certainly would be different, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. And it certainly would be fairer. It would have more equity in, in health, social justice, and all the things that we talked about. Um, I think we, we've come a long way in, 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 in terms of groups like this, you know, talk, talk to myself. And sometimes it's a bit like talking in an echo chamber. But I'm finding more and more that I'm involved with uh, in very high level discussions where the issues of human rights does come up. But Neil is quite right that there's, there's a kind of, you know, it's given, if it's given, when you, when you talk about it in, in a group of managers, for instance, or, or commissioners, it's like, it's like giving all the children um, a, a, a jam jar with the, with the top on it and say, don't, don't open that because you might not like what's inside it. Yet they play with the top. They play with the top and they shake the, they shake the jam jar, but they never actually open it. Um, and it's getting to getting people to understand that there's nothing mystical about this. There's nothing difficult about it. It's just being fair and just and proper. And a world, I, I, I kind of think that a world just governed by human rights would be would be a dream for everybody. But I, I think the difficulty would be get people to interpret them in the correct manner, as Anil alluded to. Thanks, Nigel. Anybody else want to have a 
go at future thinking of yeah lucy go on so i think um okay this is going to sound like a bit of a downer but uh, but i promise it's going to lift up in the end i think the reality is humans being humans there will always be individuals who don't really get uh, that the person in front of them is fully human like them and they don't treat them with the kindness and dignity and empathy uh, that they deserve because because that that is just how humans are towards each other but what i have learned in my um my own working in social care and the, the people i uh, work with in research and teaching is that there are also some really 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 good humans out there who don't even need a lesson in human rights to get that and actually what human rights can really do if they're set up right is empower those people to work arm in arm with people living with dementia and their allies to challenge and call out bad practice where it's happening and tackle it. And I think for me, that was the real revolution for me about discovering human rights is that actually, it wasn't just that what I was seeing in care was unpleasant or nasty or unkind, is that actually there was a legally enforceable language for saying something's going wrong here. Now, as a frontline care worker, it gave me no tools to fix that. So that's how I ended up in academia. Um, I think what we really need to do is create human rights frameworks that properly resource the people who want to do the right thing to do it and give them the means to call out the bad things where it's happening. And I think that that requires a radical transformation that goes far beyond the law books. It includes completely reconfiguring how we set up care and support and healthcare to make sure the right people are given the right resources. Um, I think it requires reshaping how the general public view older age, view care, view dementia and disability of other kinds, because I think we need to give everybody faith that actually there's a good life possible for everyone if we resource it well. And, and it's only once we've got to that position that the people who want to do good will really be able to do that. Great. Thank you, Lucy. Um, and Howard, do you want to come in? Oh. So about 40 years ago, they, they did it with cancer. They changed perceptions of cancer. They, they changed the understanding of cancer and they realised that putting the services in, people would live a better life. You know, um, and somehow we got to get politicians and the NHS and everybody else to, to think like they did 40 years ago instead of about cancer, but think about dementia and other disabilities in the same way. Um, and realise that, in the long run it's cheaper to provide these services than it is not to yeah because you with dementia you have a perverse situation where the, the, the my wife might put her health at risk to give me the best life possible but at some point she'll end up in hospital and because there's no social care available i'll be in hospital as well and that costs the nhs three thousand pound a night for the two beds you know we need to change yeah perceptions and understanding around dementia yeah thanks Howard that that's really important um, and Tom you wanted to, to say something thank you yeah I mean for me from a disability perspective seeing dementia within disability rights and human rights is about looking at our world and how it disables people and therefore uh, you might not like uh, WHO's work on age-friendly cities and some of it you know some of this language can appear patronizing but if we see people with dementia, like other people with disabilities, as citizens uh, entitled to equal rights, then we might pay attention to the ways in which we design public spaces, we design technologies, we design interactions, we design services, and really put humans, including people with dementia, right at the center of those and ensure that people are treated fairly. It's exactly what Howard and Nigel and Lucy have said. And, and, and Neil, it's about treating people as equals. And we can do that. And therefore we can less, lessen the difficulty or the burden of having an illness or impairment like dementia. And for me personally, um, working with uh, dementia inquiries, um, yeah, all of the work I've done in this area, has been really liberatory. Because like many people, like Neil, like uh, others, relatives of mine have had dementia and it's been a, a frightening diagnosis i'll be candid with you but in the interactions that i've been able to have with a lot of people um it's taken away that fear and it's like okay that exists that might be part of life but it's not something to be frightened of 
It's something that is part of life. And therefore, the sooner we respect and include people, regardless of their impairment, the better. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, and finally, Neil, and then we'll move to Q&A. Yeah, well, I absolutely echo um, all of that. Um, there's, some, there's a story I've told a few times recently, and it's in a, in a paper I wrote earlier in this year about my my dad's experience of, of Alzheimer's and how, you know, as Thomas just sort of explained and would explain, you know, without doubt, the, uh, the, the illness, if you like, was progressing. It was affecting his functioning, his ability to do various things. But he, he managed to maintain a pretty high level of well-being. And that well-being was derived from the fact that he was living in the place he called home. He was living with my mom. He was seeing his friends. He was still going to watch the rugby matches that he loved. He was still doing lots of lots of things that kind of held his well-being together. And actually, his health and his well-being came apart in the first lockdown, not really because of the dementia, but because he was suddenly unable to do all those things that held his life together. And for me, if we take that fact, and I think everyone on this call probably recognises it, that dementia isn't simply predicted by the trajectory of the disease, but by the, the social and you know the circumstances in which we're able to live our lives. And that points so clearly to the thinking that's evolved through disability rights and to the ways that we can actually change the world, not just some political ends, but to the ends of people's health and well-being. And potentially, given the big claims that were made last week about a kind of new drug that might kind of modestly delay the progress of dementia, actually, I think these social external factors can have that effect too. So in the future, I want, I don't think the work is ever really done, as Lucy has said, but I think the focus has to be on people living their best lives. And I think we'd relentlessly innovate to open up the world to everyone to improve people's experience of living with dementia. And what I'd love to see is that some non-pharmaceutical innovation could get the kind of news coverage that the drug that was, was announced last week saw, um, because it could improve people's cognitive and wider health and well-being. And I'd like to see that across every TV news bulletin, social media, uh, just as we see breakthroughs in, in, in biotech, you know, from physical ramps to cognitive ramps, occupational therapy, investing in these things that hold our personhood and well-being together, new technologies. Um, and, and I'd love to see thinking around human rights and disability rights evolve to really take account of the experience of people living with dementia, for people who are living with dementia to be sat around those tables, shaping that thinking into the future. Great, thank you, Neil. Certainly agree with that. And just before we move into Q and A, I'm just going to throw a swerve ball in, and this isn't about me trying to plug a publication, but uh, I've recently written a chapter in a book about critical studies of dementia, and was challenged by someone who comes from what's called post-humanist group, who challenged the notion of human rights because it's seen as exceptionalist and speciesist, i.e., we put humans at the top of the tree, as it were, and because of that, we're ignoring other the rights of other sentient beings and the planet itself. And therefore, that's you no know, part of the reason why we're having problems with climate change, as it were. It was a it's a very so I ended up writing a chapter trying to mm. think how can disability activism, people with dementia find alliances with climate change activists. So we recognize the rights of the planet as well as everything that lives on it without necessarily only focusing on one species, as it were. Um, it's a, yeah, uh, the book's not yet been published, but just to throw that in as a swerve sort of ball, not as a question. Um, I'm gonna to go to questions now. So I, I think Steve and Philly have been kind of monitoring the, the questions. And I, if you could just kind of come up with one or two questions um, and if you know who they're from, please do say so. If people are asking with lived experience and you know they, they don't mind you saying that, perhaps you could say that. Um, but if you could just read out one or two questions and throw them open to the panel whilst we've got a few minutes left. Oh. Okay. Oh. Go first, Philly? Shall I? Yes. Um, okay, so we've got one from Di. So I have an elderly relative who's living independently and has just received a dementia diagnosis. What's the first thing I do to protect their human rights? Good do you want question. another one? You want another one to ponder on or should we go one at a time? Yeah, one more to ponder on whilst people are thinking about protecting. Um, George oh. says, most of us find it hard. Uh, George is, is living with dementia. Um, most of us find it hard or impossible to stand up for our own rights, especially when ill. Any advice? <clears throat> So two very practical, practical focus questions there. Anybody want to come in with 
responses to Di or George? How do we how do we actually put this into practice? on a day-to-day -day basis when living with dementia or supporting someone living with dementia? I think what we were challenged to do earlier, imagine this is your mother, your grandmother, would change a lot of the way we treat people. And we know from those terrible exposures of um, Winterbourne View that uh, people with intellectual disabilities can be treated like animals, that um, uh, older people can be treated like animals, that lots of people can be treated really, really badly. And so we need to model better care, train people to get it better, and it all starts with run understanding that everybody's equal, that we are all human beings. Yeah, and I was, I was going to sort of pick up your point, Tom, about education. I suppose it's looking at that deep guide, looking at accessible sources of inf information about what human rights means in practice for you as someone living with dementia or supporting someone living with dementia and you know, informing yourself and remembering it's about everyday legislation, not just the Human Rights Act. Yeah, Lucy put a hand up and then I'll come to Nigel. I think I'm just thinking about um, recognising, I think one of the, the human rights and disability rights principles that's really calling to me there is actually recognizing the knowledge and wisdom that's held by people already living with dementia so reaching out to local self-advocacy groups and actually saying to them what what would you suggest um for me and my relative here right now how how what would have been useful to you seeing if my relative or if it was me if i wanted to go along to that group and join it um, and then with my mental capacity law hat on and also the work I've done lately around thinking about the significance of home, starting to really think about what's a good life, what, what's important to that person and really starting to get to know better what their, what their values are, what's important to them um, so that I can stand by their side in advocating for that. Mm, yeah, I agree, Lucy. And I think bringing mental capacity is really important because our ability to make decisions is so fundamental to how we live our lives and it's now enshrined in law that if if we're not being allowed to make decisions or not supporting people to make decisions themselves or not following something like the mental capacity act then that's clearly not not supporting someone's human rights so no mental capacities are often a good place to start nigel then neil well the wind has been taken on my sails by lucy and by you actually but Sorry. Uh, what I was going to say, but I mean, it's a very difficult decision to make when a nearest and dearest. When I was diagnosed, uh, the only living relative I had was a stepbrother in Chicago. Um, and what I didn't want, want to happen was him to give up his life to come to me. So we had a very difficult conversation around that. But the sooner you, 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 you talk to people right after diagnosis, the better. Then you can capture their likes, their dislikes, their preferences. Um, and not wait until the crisis happens, you know, when services are not available or where, where the situation at home becomes uh, unmanageable. Uh, there's a lot of talk about advanced directives. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, how, how you want to be treated if you become seriously ill. Advanced directives could be how you want to be treated on the rest of your dementia journey. Um, put that into place. Uh, get, get a, give, don't rush the power of attorney wait and see but when you do go to the power of attorney somebody you trust implicitly and somebody who understands the responsibilities of power of attorney as well because more often than not relations break down because one family member is given a, a power of attorney and the other isn't and then when the wills are read and all the rest of it you know there's all that kerfuffle about where did where, where did all where did all the money go Nigel, um, I'm going to I'm going to sort of thank you there because I'm really conscious of time and Neil wanted to come in, so sorry to cut you off. But I just want to see if Howard wants to say something very briefly. But Neil, can you very briefly respond to those questions and then just you know, see if Howard's got something to say before we finish? Over to you, Neil. It's going to echo very much what what Howard just said. I think that the key mistake I think my family made and happens is we didn't talk about it enough. Found it really hard to talk about it psychology of talking about the future is really really difficult and I think that's something we need to focus a lot of energy on because I think too many people end up spinning into a crisis and only talking about it at a late stage when that could be avoided 
what we were fortunate to have was a woman working with us called Helen Sanderson. And what we were using is a bit of jargon is this methodology called a strength based conversation. We're trying to focus much more on the life that my dad and my mom wanted to lead and how we could bring that about. And we developed a community circle and it wasn't about statutory services and signing forms and things like that at that stage. It was about having a life. So I think if we could start there, I think that would be my key tip. If you're right. able. Thank to. you, Neil. And um, Howard, do you just want to come in with a final comment? Well, we, we need to be seen as the primary decision maker because it's all very well making advanced directives and living wills, but I've not known them been overrided by our two consultants in the person's best interests. This this horrible thing, the best interest meetings, um, which often aren't in the individual's best interests. They're in the best interests of the service, if you like. Um, I've, I've seen that happen during my time in healthcare. Um, we should be able to document our choices, not our wishes. Our choices and that should direct decision making in the future yeah, because at the end of the day it's our life mm -hmm. you know and strangers are making decisions about people's lives every day and that shouldn't yeah. be happening so so information and awareness but also information that's produced by the person about their lives to inform how decisions get made and how their rights can be upheld that take into account them as individuals, I think, is is perhaps a, a, a sort of summary that I've attempted from, from what people have said. I'm really conscious of time. And I'm sure people have got other meetings to go to. So I'm, I could talk about this with with all of you and the audience for hours, to be honest with you. But uh, I'm, we're going to have to call it to a halt there. So I'm sorry if you asked a question and didn't manage to get it answered. But I'm conscious a lot of activities going on in the chat room. So perhaps answers are coming up there. The session has been recorded, so you can watch it again or contact Deep or contact Innovations and Dementia um, if you want to, to follow things up. I'm sure they'd be happy to, to hear from you. So it just remains for me to say, um, at one minute to one, to thank Howard and Nigel, Neil, Tom and Lucy for all their contributions um, and sharing the expertise today, for Phil, to Philly and Steve, um, for excellent uh, backroom facilitation and making sure the technology ran. Thank you, everybody who's come along today for your questions and your contributions and listening. I hope you've got something from this. I always find I learn something and think about things in different ways as a result of this. So um, I think it's been, been a great session. Um, the panel members, and I think Steve and Philly are just going to stay on uh, for a, a couple more minutes, um, but it just remains me for me to say happy anniversary to Deep again. And there are more more sessions as part of the festival uh, later today and tomorrow, I think. So please do join them. Uh, the ones I've been to have been absolutely fantastic. And uh, if nothing else, look forward to another festival in 20 years time or 10 years time, the 20th anniversary. So thanks, everyone. And we're all going to say goodbye now. But we're staying on the panel, um, just staying on the call for a short period of time. Thank you and goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.